Okay, Shavua Tov, everybody. It's um, nice to be able to spend the Sunday morning with you all, especially with our special guest, Mr. Daniel Corin, the Director of Hasbara Fellowships of Canada. Many of you are familiar with uh, the work of Hasbara and the work that Daniel is doing, but um, by way of uh, introduction, Daniel, please tell us uh, what does Hasbara Fellowships do? What is their, what is their mission statement? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me, Rabbi Karapkin, and uh, Bokal Tov. Good morning to everyone with us. Um, our mission at Hasbara Canada is simple. It is to train and empower student leaders uh, to be advocates for Israel and the Jewish people on campus. Uh, I'm sure many of you with us today are familiar with the anti-Israel movement that exists on campus and is very prominent on certain campuses. Um, really one of the biggest challenges for students is to speak about these issues and to have the confidence to speak about these issues. And what we do is we, we train them, we empower them, we bring them, um, especially for our fellows on college and university campuses, on an intensive 16-day advocacy training program uh, to Israel and to Palestinian cities so that they can meet Israelis and Palestinians on the ground and they can get a firsthand experience um, you know, and really understand these issues in a way that no other students can without visiting these areas. And then when these students return to their respective campuses, and we have fellows from across the country, uh, they serve as advocates for Israel. They, they build, they, they create coalitions with other student groups on campus. They uh, engage and they educate other students about Israel, about Zionism. There's unfortunately a lot of misinformation and propaganda out there. And, and our fellows uh, refute a lot of that propaganda that you see on campus. And they're also very proactive in, in speaking to students in a, in a way that they understand uh, you know, ab about, about Israel and about uh, these issues. All right, well, I wanna probe a little bit deeper. Uh, give us an idea of what's going on in uh, 2021, in the fall of 2021 on campus these days. Is the, <clears throat> is the bigger issue uh, student unions uh, uh, on campus is the bigger issue, what's going on in the classroom. Uh, for someone who is either in university themselves or has a child uh, about to go into university, what should we be concerned about when we send our children, let's say to York University or to University of Toronto or to any university across North America? What are some of the um, challenges that some of the, the young adults in our community may be confronting? So the, the, those are several excellent questions. Um, I would say firstly that, you know, because I've heard from a lot of members of the community, um, should my son or daughter go to York or is it too dangerous for a Jewish student here? And, and I will off the ground say that, that, um, that I, I, don't, I don't even agree with the premise of, of the question, um, you know, that Jewish students should, are free to go anywhere and should go anywhere. There, there is um, like York, for example, has a great center for, for Jewish life. Um, you know, there's a lot of positives at these universities, you know, about, about being a Jewish student. So that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, but the challenges definitely do exist, you know, at campuses like York and U of T and, um, uh, you know, and McGill and UBC and from, from across the country. I would say the challenges exist in the classroom, as you said, Rabbi Kropkin, and also and from student unions and student groups. It's coming from, from certain places. So we can start with in the classroom with professors, in in my mind, and in my, and in my experience, with, you know, with students who are complaining about what they're seeing coming from their professors, there are a lot of professors who have a very, um, very biased perception when it comes to Israel and the Palestinian territories, and they're so biased to the extent that they are uh, conspicuously overlooking the Jewish connection to Israel and. Um, engaging, I would say, in what people could say is kind of the, the revisionism, you know, of, of Jewish history, because I've heard stories of professors who speak about the Palestinians who are indigenous to the land, but that Jews don't have a right to be there. I've heard stories of professors um, belittling experiences of anti-Semitism, saying, oh, what you Jewish students on campus are going through is nothing compared to the Palestinians. Um, anti-Semitism has been, become politicized by some of these professors that J Jewish students are, are afraid to, to identify as Jewish and they're afraid to even speak up uh, in the classroom, which is again, you know, what, what we do here at Hasbro Fellowship. So 
that I would say is one of the, the, the deepest and uh, most worrisome concerns is that when you have professors who are engaging this type of rhetoric and they are outright demonizing Israel, they're writing op-eds in Al Jazeera, like we've seen a few weeks ago from the, a professor at Sheridan College. I've seen professors at uh, University of Victoria in, in, in um, St. Mary's in ha Halifax and in, again, campuses all across the country writing op-eds and, and writing personal blog posts there's a professor at York that just last week wrote a very, very misleading and factually incorrect blog post about Israel. Um, this emboldens students who are in their classrooms, right, to come after Israel. It's, it's, it's open season. The professors are doing it. Um, when the professors are saying Zionism is racism, when you have Jewish groups and Jewish students identify as Zionist on campus, which the majority of students do, the majority of Jews in Canada do, uh, this puts a, a target on their backs and, and this essentially tells the students it's okay to attack Zionism because the professors are doing it. Um, so that may, may I interrupt for just a moment? Oh, please, um, please, that can talk about I think we all are aware of some of the liberalism and with liberalism, liberalism is associated as far as the Middle East is concerned as sympathy with the underdog, as sympathy with the Palestinians, we know what's going on with Ben and Jerry's and so many other, so many other corporations around the world. The BDS movement. Um, it's it's been a, it's been a progression over the last couple of decades for sure. Perhaps it goes back even longer. Yes. But 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 where did where did we fall? Were we asleep at the wheel? The Jewish community. Like, <laughs> can you can you explain how this happened and how it's become so lopsided? Uh, on campus, especially in regards to Israel and the Jewish community? Well, from, from, from what I've seen, Rabbi Karabkin, from my experience, this has been in academia for a very long time, right? If you, you know, I have um, peers who, are, who, who have done research, you know, into how deep this goes, as, as you said, and how far this goes. And it seems that, you know, it goes back to the, to the 60s or even earlier. There, it was there was always a very, you know, kind of very left-wing mentality on campus. And since it dates back to the 60s and you had, um, you know, those people with the keys to academia, let's say, they only let in other professors, you know, with certain mentalities, right? And it came to this point where now, you know, this anti-Israel mentality, I would say, is very much in, ingrained, uh, you, you know, in academia. And I say this from conversations with, with many professors who are, who, with many Jewish professors who are concerned and who are worried, you know, ab about what's going on. So it's, it's something that I think at, at this point, professors, when they have tenure, it is very, very difficult um, to have them removed from their positions, even when they are being completely outrageously one-sided and even arguably anti-Semitic. There are professors who you can make the accusation that they are being anti-Semitic from the tweets, from their attacks on, on people like uh, Abraham Foxman and the ADL, uh, and, and yet freedom of speech, freedom of speech. I can, there, there was an occasion with the University of Lethbridge, uh, a professor named Anthony Hall, and this man was an outright Holocaust denier. He had a YouTube program where he questioned the Holocaust, where he questioned Zyklon B, where he questioned the facts surrounding this, surrounding the Shoah. And it took several years for, for him to be removed from his position at the University of Lethbridge because he was a tenured professor. So just to use it as an example, we are up against um, a big problem here when it comes to professors with this mentality. And in my experience, one of the, the best ways to be able to respond to that is to have students being confident enough to question their professors, right? right? Because this, the students that we work with at Hasbara and especially Zionist students, they're not anti-Palestinian in any way, shape, or form. And, and we, when we bring them to Israel, we want them to meet Palestinians because we want them to see how BDS is detrimental to Palestinians who, who want to work in Israel, so who profit what Israelis profit, who are able to make much more money in Israel and thousands of which cross the border for that very reason. Um, it's, it's not as, as simple you know, as some of these professors put it and, and some of these student groups. So really, in our experience, you're able to make uh, and create effect, effective change and meaningful change by having the students speak up, by having students 
say, wait a second, professor, why are you only speaking about the indigenous Palestinians and not also speaking about the indigenous Jews? Because you don't need to support one people at the expense of another people. And I think there are many students who still understand this. And when they hear students speaking up, you know, that raises the question. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Why, why is, is it being, why is the information presented to me so incredibly one-sided about, about these issues? Because really, you know, there, there should be both perspectives shared. And in many cases, there, there are not. All right, let's say I am a, um, I'm a student uh, in grade 12 in, uh, in Yeshivot Bnei Akiva or Chaim Ulpana, or I go to another yeshiva and I plan to go to university in a year uh, or a couple of years after my gap year in Israel, um, haven't I been properly inoculated and trained to be able to, uh, to deal with the anti-Semitism on campus? I mean, after all, I mean, I have all of this education, I have all of this yeshiva education. Um, why is it important for me to engage with Hasbara fellowships? What will I learn? What will I gain uh, with Hasbara that I haven't learned already in, in my years in school and my gap year in Israel? And I'll and I'll go. I'll take that one step further, and just as part B of that question, uh, it, assuming that Hasbara fellowships will provide me with a much richer narrative that I can bring with me to my campus. What should I be doing, if anything at all, while in high school and during my gap year in Israel to sort of prepare me for the life on campus? Excellent, excellent questions. Uh, so firstly, Hasbara Fellowships, a few years ago, we launched a high school program to, to deal with this, these very needs. Um, we saw that there were many Jewish students coming out of Jewish schools while they had this education they had not ever been in non-Jewish environments. And of course, we know that these campuses are not fully Jewish. They're very, uh, there's a very minimal amount of Jewish students, obviously, on, on all of these campuses. Um, we found that while they had the education, and as you said, as in Torah, it's, it's not the same on, on campus because we're not talking about Torah. In fact, when we have our students speaking to other students on campus, I. I tell them don't mention Torah at all. It's, it's not necessary for them to mention Torah. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. There is enough archeological and historical evidence and genetic evidence that confirms that the Jewish people are indigenous to the land and that we have always um, maintained this relationship to Israel and we've always been present in Israel. It's not even necessary to refer to the Torah. And I think that the, um, the challenges as well as when you're dealing with very agnostic and atheist students and as you know students these days you know they're very progressive i, I would say you know religious students in, in general can have a hard time regardless of their religion on uh, on campus um it, it makes a stronger argument with these students when you're able to speak to these these other issues so what we do at hasbara in our high school program is we teach our, our students about these issues uh in in a way that that from what I've seen, they're not really getting in their Jewish education. You know, we're, we're talking about BDS. We're talking about how to respond to anti-Israel claims on campus. And again, th these are fluid. This is happening and changing all the time. As we've seen, anti-Semitism has continued to evolve. You know, there have been different types of manifestations of anti-Semitism throughout millennia. Um, it, it exists the same way today on social media. Social media is fickle. It continues to change. And there are always new ways to respond to these anti-Israel claims and to anti-Semitism uh, on campuses and online. And a lot of this now, especially recently with COVID, has been happening online. So we teach high school students why Jews are an indigenous people. We teach them um, why BDS is, is anti-Semitic. We teach them why anti-Zionism is, is typically anti-Semitism cloaked in, in disguise. But, but we teach them also not to use this word frivolously anti-Semitism, because there are a lot of students who, when participating in, in certain trends, and especially if, as we recall in, in May, there was a lot of anti-Israel activity following the conflict with Hamas, a, a lot of students that are doing this are, are ignorant, are misguided. They're not necessarily anti-Semitic. Um, you, you know, we've heard things like the Free Palestine, the slogan, Free Palestine is a dog whistle uh, for, for the destruction of Israel. And that's because the believers, the, the founders of this slogan typically uh, promote the destruction of Israel. But many people who say Free Palestine today, you know, and they're doing it because they believe they're 
you know, purveyors of social justice or, or, or whatever, uh, are not necessarily anti-Semitic. They, you know, they might be ignorant or misguided on, on this. And this is something that we educate our high school students that we need to engage in conversations with these students uh, privately, typically to avoid you know, um, contributing to any negative algorithms on social media. You know, we tell these students, privately message your friends who are posting this. Tell them, did you realize Free Palestine typically doesn't mean let's have a two-state solution, let's work together, let's find a future for both of these peoples on the ground. It typically means let's get rid of the Jews and bring in an Arab state of Palestine. And whatever happens to the 6 million Jews doesn't really matter, right? And that's something that a lot of people are not cognizant of. So this, these are the conversations that we have with our high school students. Uh, and we do it in a way that very much engages them and speaks their language. You know, our high school advisor, Pearl Gasner, has been doing it for several years. She's a wonderful educator. And it's a, it's a great program, I, I think, that, uh, you know, really prepares high school students for when they get onto whatever university campus. And which, um, which high schools are you currently uh, working with uh, to get this message to them? We have students at, at several schools at, at, at Chat, at Associated, at Alpanad, or, or Chaim. Um, we have students in Ottawa. Uh, we have some students in, in Montreal. You know, we're, we're really over, all, all over. We've been operational as a high school program now. It's our third year, I, I believe. So we're still, you know, we're still young. We have a very startup uh, mentality. But I'd say, especially since May, there's, there's been an explosion uh, in, in terms of hearing from the community. There have been more and more community members, you know, um, camps, you know, who have reached out to do um, activity with us. Um, we're, we're doing engagement and programs with um, in Ottawa and Calgary and Winnipeg, you know, um, so we're, I think more and more students and community members are, are realizing that this is a problem, that this exists, uh, you know, and it's something that needs to be addressed. I'm just wondering, um, when a student is in their gap year between high school and university, which is so common with so many of the students in our congregation, in our community, um, is there any opportunity for them to connect with Hasbara and perhaps go on a day uh, trip, a tiul, as, as it were, to meet Palestinians and to see what's really going on on the ground? So that's an excellent question. Um, there are actually a few ways. Firstly, we are actually we are working on a way. We're working, uh, you know, with a few partner organizations uh, to be able to offer a unique experience for gap year students who are in Israel. It's so it's it's a very well timed question. We're hoping, actually, by very early uh, 2022, to have a program that's operational in Israel for gap year students. Uh, in the interim, we offer various virtual programs throughout the year. Uh, and two very intensive virtual summits that we offer for high school and university students from across North America. Um, it's called Israel Engage. It takes place in the summer and in the winter. So Israel Engage summer, Israel Engage winter. The next one will be in January. Uh, and it's where we have very high profile speakers. Our last conference, we had uh, Brett Stevens, New York Times uh, award-winning journalist. We had uh, Noah Tishby, a, a very popular um, is Israeli activist and influencer. You know, we had speakers such as Emily Schrader, Ben Freeman. And uh, the great thing about these virtual summits is that they're led by students. You know, so you see me, a minimal amount. Uh, it's the, the sessions are moderated by our students and then, you know, by our Hasbara fellows. And then the Q&A is, is done by students as well. And I, I think the members of our community really appreciate that because that's what Hasbara is about. You know, if, if, um, if people want to ask questions on their own, you know, there's Thankfully, so many wonderful and rich Jewish organizations and shuls, uh, you know, po -po -po within Toronto, you know, where they have that opportunity. With, uh, with Hasbara, we want to make sure when people are participating and coming to our programs, they're seeing our, our students who are confident, who are empowered, um, you know, who, who are speaking about these issues articulately. And I think our supporters especially want, want to see that as well. So that's, that's what we offer a few times a, a year. And there's always typically some sort of virtual program that we're hosting. Wonderful. Um, and, and we are happy to, to proliferate that message as, uh, as much as we can, because it's so important. But I, I'm going to ask you um, a, a, a bit of a provocative question, if I may. I'm going sure. to put myself in the shoes of a young university student. It wasn't that long ago that I attended university. I went back to school to earn another graduate degree uh, several years ago. As you know, as, as when I was already married with children, but 
but so but but here's here's my question i'm thinking about being i'm going to university i have a very very busy schedule of classes of lab work of uh, of of all of these different kinds of activities and as long as i keep my head down and i get out of my car or get off the bus and walk straight to my class and go straight home I may not even be in a liberal arts program or a humanities program where I have to even hear these kinds of messages. So uh, uh, maybe I'll ignore the signs, uh, you know, of the Muslim Student Union that are, that are anti-Israel. Um, why why can't I just live my life and get my education and move on? Like in other words, why is it important for me as a Jewish student who is not in does not have a professor? who is purveying these kinds of slanted propaganda, why should I get involved? That question hits home. The reason you have to get involved is because they are attacking your identity. You know that you are a Jewish student. So regardless of how Jewish you are, you know you're Jewish, Judaism is being attacked. It's very unfortunate to me that we have to do this, that for students, for Jewish students on campus, they have to get involved. They have to speak up because it's hard. It's hard for them, right? Who the, we tell our fellows, by the way, never to get um, to always engage the seventy percent because we tell them there's no point to engage in conversations with the pro-Israel side. They're already on on side, uh, you know. And there's no point to engage in conversations with people who are hostile, who are outright anti-Israel. They probably won't change their mind. But the seventy percent, you know, you you have students who are misguided or don't know or misinformed and those are the ones you can actually have conversations with the reason we do this is because i don't want to send students to go get into you know verbal wars on on campus and it's unfortunate that they have to to do this at all that they can't just go and be regular students as you said just go take your classes you know go home uh, don't worry about it and to, to that i would say the jewish people not just jewish students but especially students because they're you know they're fighting this war on, on campus I, I think all Jewish people have a unique responsibility to, to stand up and to make our voices heard. And the reason I think that is that I've seen the campaign, the movement with my very eyes um, that seeks to rewrite Jewish history, that seems to rewrite what it means to be Jewish. And I take that very seriously. Um, I'm very passionate ab about that and, and, and millions of other Jews, I think, are very passionate about that. And because we are witnessing this campaign, because it is happening before our very eyes, either we can go to class and not do anything about it. And absolutely, you can. And absolutely, there are students who do that. But just know that when you're not standing up, that's one less voice. And we already have so few voices because we are such a minority as it is. And, and the fellows that we work with, for example, they're passionate about their Judaism too. They, they don't want to get into arguments with anyone. As I said, they're not anti-Palestine. They want to see peace. They, they, you know, many of them are two staters, one staters, not, none of that matters. They want to see peace and, and coexistence between these students. We even had a, a sticker campaign now where we gave stickers to students and the stickers say peace and prosperity for Israelis and Palestinians because that's what the majority of our fellows want to see. Um, it would be very easy for them not to get involved, but I think when students see misinformation, when you see propaganda, when you see that your very identity is being attacked, um, you you want to do something about it, and, and that's what's happened. I think with the, with a lot of fellows, with a lot of students who are online, who are on social media, they're seeing so much misinformation about Israel. They're seeing that this simply is not true. That they've identified as Zionists their whole lives, and they've never they've never been racist. They've never had problems with Muslims, they never had problems with Palestinians. Sure, the ones who are terrorists and want us dead, that's, that's one thing. And I th don't think you can blame me for having a problem with someone who wants me dead. But outside of that, this is not something they've ever felt. And now they're seeing that Zionism is being attacked, that Israel is being attacked. And, and I think a lot of them want to stand up. I would tell you, I'm seeing a movement happening right now, which I think has very much been prompted by the recent the, uh, conflict, uh, sorry, galvanized by the recent conflict in May, where, where students are, are being very confident and, and they're owning their Zionism. We see so many speakers like Rudy Rockman and Ben Freeman and Chen Mazig and 
some of our fellows, uh, previous fellows like Isabel Hazan, there's a great rapper by the name of Noah Shepetinsky, West Side Gravy, and they're all influencers in their own respect, their own, they're all telling their stories as Jews. And they're saying, we, we have no problem with Palestinians. We want to see peace, but we are Zionists. We support Israel's right to exist. We support Israel's right to exist as a Jewish country. We're not gonna deviate from that. And a lot of students I think are, being motivated by that and, are, and and this is catching on, which is a beautiful thing. It wasn't happening when I was on campus. Uh, you know, so I could only say for those students that don't want to get involved, listen, I can't blame you. Sometimes it isn't easy, but it's but you're also doing an important work. If we don't speak up for ourselves, no one will. Um, and, and you'll find many friends and, and good people along the way. Well, that's, I mean, that's a very encouraging message, and, I, and it leads really to my next question for you, Daniel, and that is, is that since the vast majority of Jews, that are, especially young Jews who are on campus, really want to see peace and are concerned not only for Israel, but also for the Palestinian neighbors, um, there's no question that many Palestinians, especially in Gaza, their quality of life is far reduced from what it could be and should be. Because of their own, because because of their own government, uh, Hamas, that is uh, that is uh, exploiting them in order to to forward a, a propagandist message. The, the the question that that really I have is is that uh, instead of creating these two sides, it would seem to me that you're what 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 you've just portrayed is that there are many uh, of our of the members of our Jewish community who recognize that we have to coexist and we have to try and raise up the level of welfare for both sides. And that Jews and Palestinians ideally should live side by side, work side by side, not, can, not prolong a conflict that is completely unnecessary at this point. Uh, and so the question is, who, wh who are your partners in the Muslim community that you can work with that that recognize that we're, we're not we're not enemies, but we have to try and figure out how to work together. That's that's a great question. I, I think that's something that every Zionist I, I, I see and every progressive Zionist especially um, is, is looking for constantly and not, and not just Muslim partners. I think we're looking for partners for allies in general. I think the Abraham Accords was was a great thing um, that that has really led online, especially so many Emir Emiratis to celebrate Israel, so many Moroccans to celebrate Israel. And, and, and this is something, again, that it's, it's a matter of peace. It's, it's a matter of coexisting. You know, we, we are not a political organization. We're an, an, a nonpartisan organization. We don't talk about you know, whatever the, the politics of, of Israel are, because that's for, for them to decide. You know, all we can say as Canadians is we want to see, as, as you said, Rabbi Karofkin, we want to see them working in peace. We want them to see themselves as, as neighbors, as being able to to get along with with all of Israel's neighbors, I think that's the ultimate goal for every Israeli. Nobody wants to have to, you know, participate in this, right? Um, so I, I think there's many many ways, and I think first and foremost for student leaders who are on campus, there's so many things that you can do to get involved, um, and especially getting involved with with student government, and especially seeing, you know, who the leaders in student government are, um, you know, and when it comes to engaging with other student groups. You know, it's, it's unfortunate that we even need to discuss our politics and what we feel about Israel and Palestine and, and all of these issues. But I think, again, most students that I know, they, they only want to advocate for, for peace, for prosperity, for, for Israelis and for, for Palestinians. And if that's something that we can communicate, you know, to other student groups, you know, there are many student groups, I think, who will, who will respond to that, right? You know, we've seen, for example, um, students who have... Um, you know, lobbied student unions to adopt the IHRA IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, and in that definition, it shows clearly that when you demonize Israel, when you compare the IDF to Nazis, that's a form of anti-Semitism. And there were many student groups who who agreed and who absolutely wanted to sign on to that definition. Um, you, you know, and it's and I think it's something that shows you can create, you know, and build these these bridges. And I won't lie, there are, you know, what I expect for uh Students for Justice in Palestine or Students Against Israeli Apartheid uh, group to to work with you? No, and 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 that's unfortunate, right? It's very unfortunate. Um, but unfortunately, there's there's no way you know where I've seen any students being able to work with them because they, you know, kind of maintain the stance that they do not want to see Israel existing, or they they they, they are so critical of Israel that they 
want to see armed resistance. And, and this is what we've, we've seen from those student groups. We've seen them invite outright terrorists you know, to speak on webinars and they've invited outright terrorists to their campus. Um, you know, terrorists who have lauded the murder, you know, the indiscriminate murder of Jews. So it, it's, it's a challenge that still exists, but I think there are ways to get around that. As I said, we engage the 70%. There are many students and many student clubs that we can build bridges with. And, you know, we need to rewrite this, this narrative. This narrative that is happening right now is simply not, not true. Um, there, there is, you know, many people and many experts will, will tell you that the Palestinians also have, you know, a responsibility here. And when they have refused to recognize Israel's right to exist, when they've refused to come to the negotiating table, and when they put their own people at harm's way, they are worth condemning. You know, when Hamas sends thousands of rockets and they want their own people to die and become martyrs, that is worth condemning. And when you see that pro-Palestine groups are not speaking to this, I don't know how you're pro-Palestine because being pro-Palestine would speak to the to the support of Palestinians, no matter what, no matter if it's if they're being, you know, attacked by the Lebanese or the Egyptians or by Hamas, right? And that's not something we see from the, those student groups. So, yes, we need to make changes in that we need to show, you know, we are we are supporting of both of these peoples, but at the same time, not at the expense of of one, right? We're not going to support. Palestinians and Israelis, but also be fine with the Hamas mission state mission statement because that would mean all Israelis are going to die under Hamas, and that's that's something that still kind of hasn't been quite, uh, you know, communicated clearly enough, you know, to some of these student groups, and it's something we have to continue to work on. You, you know, the more allies we're able to find, the more student groups we're able to build coalitions with and say, hey, we are support two peoples. We want to see an end to anti-Muslim hatred, an end to anti-Jewish hatred. Um, when we're able to communicate that and build more allies then that's a way we can effectively change this narrative uh, you know, that we're hearing and seeing right now. Right, I mean, your response is what I was expecting to hear, but it's, it's a little bit disheartening um, in that um, we, we, I, I, I think so many of us would love to see us at a point where we can find moderate voices on both sides, where the narratives are not so uh, contrary to each other that there's no room at the table for, for both sides to sit. Um, I think, you know, I think, I think hearing you, you've, you've, you know, you represent a moderate position that you acknowledge that Palestinians are suffering, that there, there, there has to be, um, there has to be more that can be done to help the Palestinian people. But at the same time, this does not mean dismantling the state of Israel or compromising on Israel's security. Exactly. Right? Now, you would think that there would be someone or a group of people or uh, 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 in, in the Arab world or in the Muslim world uh, that at least lives uh, in North America as well, that is able to appreciate that idea. And there, and there are, there, there definitely are. I, I, I don't want to say that, that there aren't, but right, it's, I can speak to the Palestinian groups that I've seen specifically, such as, you know, SIA or SJP, you know, that are not moderate in this way, right? But, you know, I, I have to, to assume that there, that there are, there, there are, for example, groups that are very much kind of, um, you, you know, pro-peace, pro right? And we've seen at York and UFT, you know, some student clubs recently emerged, but those are, those are kind of one-off student clubs, you know, but, but are trying to take the narrative of peace for two peoples, as opposed to what we've seen from these clubs that I mentioned, uh, you know, SJP Saya that are very anti-Israel, right? So it's, it's something that I think in the pro-Palestine side um, isn't something that I've seen on campus. It isn't something I believe exists on campus, a pro-Palestine group that also wants peace with Israel. I, I, I haven't seen it. It's, I mean, it's, it's, so, um, it, it's so saddening to, to hear that. Um, and, and I guess that uh, we can only pray that at some point they will, they will uh, 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 Develop a critical mass of people who are uh, who sympathize with the Palestinian narrative and at the same time would like to see peace with Israel, because that would really be a boon. It would really be a tremendous help to uh, quieting some of the, uh, the really the, the nasty uh, voices that seem to uh, seem to have sort of co-opted the the Palestinian cause. And yeah. I, I am sure, I am sure that it's a silent majority 
of uh, of people who are part of the Muslim community, especially part of the, or or expats from Palestine, who really do recognize that this is this is like we say in Hebrew, lo zuhaderech, that they're they're not really going to be getting anywhere by constantly demonizing and de delegitimizing Israel. It's not, it hasn't worked, it's not going to work. Um, and, uh, and hopefully that voice will be heard. I, I, you know, we're getting some, um, some questions from the chat and I was wondering if I could uh, open it up to our, to our audience. Um, okay. uh, one, uh, one, of our, one of the people on, uh, that's on the Zoom call is asking the question, what can we do as uh, people who are alumni of these universities? You know, us, us older people, um, it, 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 does the voice of, of an alumnus carry any weight uh, at the university? If I'm an alumnus of U of T or of York or of any, uh, any other university, what can I do to make my voice heard? So, so I will always argue, um, you know, while, while you'll see people that say, oh, it's, you know, writing letters or signing petitions is, is a waste of time. I would always say participating, um, you know, in endeavors su such as those can be can be helpful, you know, because I have seen occasions where the community involvement, you know, can can do something right. Um, you know, uh, for, for example, right when I started with Hasbara two years ago, there was uh, a U of T student group who invited a PFLP terrorist to speak on campus. Um, he was someone who had been deemed a border to the security of Canadians by the Canada Border Service Agency and still invited to speak. Uh, and and we, we, you know, we, we complained. We said this was uh, absurd. Many community members sent letters, you know, and um, uh, they never told us it was, it was because the community had got involved. But eventually the event did not take place on campus. Mind you, it still took place. QP was involved and it was held at the QP offices. But it it did move. Sorry, what is what is what is QP? Uh, QP is a uh, union. Um, it's a union. What is it? Uh, Canadian Union of Public Employees. Uh, so one of the one of the QPs. There are many there are many QPs that are unfortunately very hostile to Israel and have even written letters. But that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, you know, but th there there were people who got involved that were able to do something right. So, and and when you see, um, you know radical right anti-israel or you know or, or hateful in general um content that's coming from professors where you're you're hearing about student groups you know i absolutely always encourage you to to get involved to write to write letters to to do whatever you can um you know because sometimes that that does absolutely make a difference right right and it's uh it's a it's a challenging road road ahead at, at times because there are many professors we've complained about that it doesn't lead anywhere um but there but there are times when speaking up can help Okay, all right, thank you. Um, a question for you, Daniel. Do you think that there are, are fewer moderate Muslims because they're intimidated by the more radical Palestinian groups? Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question. I, I absolutely do, I absolutely do. And, and I can speak to Palestinians, for, for example. Um, they, they, they can't speak up, right? They can't speak up. I, I can tell you occasions where we've worked with um, you know, Palestinians in, in Toronto, you know, who wanted to support coexistence and uh, they had been living living here. And as soon as they did something with us, you know, they, the family member, their family members were threatened, uh, you know, and they had to stop immediately, right? Their family members by, by, back home. And it's something that you see all, all the time and you hear of all the time um, that Palestinians can't speak up against Hamas, right? They, they, they can't speak out against it. They're, they're living under a terrorist <laughs> regime, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not as simple as being able to say, oh, I'm against my, my government, right? And it's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that there's so many misconceptions, uh, you know, about Palestinians, you know, and when you meet Isra Israelis, and when we bring our fellows, by the way, we bring them to the borders of Gaza, we have them speak to IDF um, generals who will tell them, I've had many Palestinian friends. I have many Palestinian friends, and I'm an RDF sergeant, you know, who has been stationed in Gaza. So it's it's not as black and white, right, as you might hear about it thousands of miles away in in, in the West. It's it's something where you know many Israelis and Palestinians do you know kind of want to come together, and and Palestinians can't speak out about that. So back here on campus, I think absolutely there are groups that are bullied. You know, when when you see, I've seen students. Who, who, who 
claim and, and ask and support for peace and prosperity between both these peoples. And they are attacked, they are condemned. They, they say, oh, that's racism. You know, again, Zionism is, is racism to radical elements of the left. Uh, you know, so you can't support it. <laughs> you know, you can't support any sort of scenario where Zionism exists. And as such, the Jews don't achieve their self-determination. You know, they no longer have access to a land. And, and this is, you know, kind of what the, the radical left wants. Um, I, I think the way we, you, you know, we combat that is, is we need more people speaking up. And again, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to do this, but, but we do. And for those Arabs, you see more Emiratis and more Moroccans, for example, you know, who are speaking up, right? There are excellent um, influencers from the United Arab Emirates now who are online, you know, who, who advocate for peace, who advocate for peace in the Middle East. And especially they're very much pro-Israel in the sense that they support Zionism. And that now has legitimized, you know, with the Abraham Accords as well, it's legitimized, you know, peace between Arabs and Jews. And we need to continue sharing that narrative. Uh, you know, we need to be able to be as loud as the radical elements are, because the radical elements are very loud online, unfortunately. All right. Now, and that leads to our next question, the, the radical uh, voices online. Uh, there's been so much talked about uh, regarding cyberbullying. What action can a Jewish student take if he or she is being cyberbullied because of their pro-Israel position? So I, I, I don't even want to share the horrific things that I saw following the conflict in May, um, where students, even if they just had a, an Israeli flag in their picture, were, were attacked by their peers um, on, on, on certain campuses. It, it, was, it was very, very hard to see because these, these, these students, in their minds, they weren't, weren't doing anything wrong. Um, automatically, I, I always say we need to reach out to the administration. The, right away, you need to reach out to the administration. If you are on, on campus, uh, you know, at whatever university, uh, this, this cannot stand. You, know, you need to ensure that student undergoes anti-Semitism training. Um, you know, oftentimes, I'll be tachless. I haven't seen students being ex expelled or, or, or suspended even, but some sort of reprimand is necessary. And especially, I, I always support anti-Semitism training when you can, because you know, again, it depends on the student. Sometimes the students are just outright hateful, but sometimes they are ignorant you know, in, in, in what they are doing. So um, contacting the administration and contacting also organizations such as mine, um, Hasbro Fellowships, because we work with students all the time. Um, that had happened a few times uh, you know, over this last year where students were, were attacked. And they reached out and, and we told them. It's never a matter of making a fuss, right? And, and, and a, a lot of the work that we do is behind the scenes because a lot of the time, you know, the students don't want to, to be vocal about it. And a lot of times, you know, the, the students, if it's regarding a professor, they don't want to jeopardize their grades, for example. So a lot of the work is, is behind the scenes. And I'd highly recommend reaching out to Hasbro or reaching out to Hillel or, um, you know, Brene Brith or so many great organizations that do that type of work. Uh, you know, and obviously depending on the scenario, even, and even the police sometimes I would suggest, but from, from my experience, absolutely reaching out to Hasbro has helped because sometimes, unfortunately, I've seen universities sweep it un, under the rug. I've seen them take months before responding to students about it. And when they get support from us, you know, I, I don't mind sending several letters, you know, to that administration until I know what is happening and that an investigation is being launched. Um, because, because, yeah, a few of the things I saw were, were just awful. So, if there are any students who have ever experienced that, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but truly get involved with, with Hasbro, reach out to Hasbro, uh, you know, reach out to the administration, you know, make, make sure it doesn't just happen, uh, you know, and, and because if you don't do anything about it, it might happen again to another Jewish student, right, or to another student in general. Okay, that's an important point. I mean, you touched on something very, uh, very tangentially, but there is, I think, a, a legitimate fear that some students may have that if they do speak out, especially if they are in, in a course with a professor who is uh, spouting anti-Israel rhetoric, that this could actually affect their grade, their, their whole GPA, their whole future in, uh, in university. Yeah. Would you, how would you address those, those fears? Yeah, so I've had a few experiences, several, unfortunately, where that has happened. Um, in one case, there was a student um, at a university in Halifax, uh, and um, it, it, she felt bullied by, by her professor, uh, you know, because she had spoken out. She's a Hasbro fellow, so of course she had spoken out, um, and she felt bullied by her professor. But she had said to me that she didn't want to do anything about it, 
um, because she was in the class, she went to get her grades, and I respect that. So, so what she asked was, can we wait until the class is over, until I get my marks, and until the next academic year, you know, for us to launch a complaint against the professor? And that's exactly what what we did, um, you know. And and she ended up speaking with the professor, and those concerns were 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 heard. Now, it's it's not something I I suggest all the time. It it really depends, right? Right. It really is a case by case basis. There are many students, you know, I've I've had professors just this year that they gave out reading materials, you know, that compared the Warsaw ghetto to Gaza, right? And we had the student come to us and say they felt very uncomfortable by it, you know, and they wanted to speak to the professor. They didn't want to wait because they, they felt other students are, are hearing this. They're, this is a ridiculous and offensive comparison. And, and she, you know, she wasn't concerned about jeopardizing her grades. And the professor actually responded, you know, positively, mind you, he didn't change the the, um, the reading material, um, but but it wasn't something I think that jeopardized her grade at all, and and she spoke out about it. But that's that again, I think, is is one of the challenges that we face. That students might speak out, they they might speak to the professors, and sometimes it might do something, sometimes it might not, right? Um, but it really depends on on the case. I have absolutely like I would never recommend or encourage a student who is experiencing something like this with the professor, you know, to automatically make a, a complaint or a big deal about it, because there are times when it doesn't make sense, right? And if it doesn't make sense, and if it's something where you want to do something about it, but we, but we can wait it out, there's nothing wrong with waiting, right? Like in the end, number one, you know, our, our goal is to support students, right? Is to support these students, to help them to do anything we, you know, we can to empower them, you know, and to and to to give them that confidence, to give them that support. So, there that has happened on a few occasions where you know we've waited it out. But typically, we do say something, and the students always fine with with that, um, even if we wait it out. Because if they had felt wronged by it, you know, chances are another student might feel wronged about it. And you know, I I understand if they have trepidation. It it really depends on the case. It depends on the student. Okay. Um, someone uh, on our chat would like to know if, the, if it's possible to um, confront or take on this organization, QP, that apparently more people know about than I do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my, for my ignorance. No, not at all. QP is massive. QP is a massive, massive organization. There are different, um, you know, there are different sections within, within QP, but it is the union of public employees. There are hundreds and thousands of thousands of employees that it represents, I believe. Um, we, we've seen this from unions. We, we saw, um, you know, B'nai B'rith and the Canadian Postal Unions, you know, have a, have a thing, you know, because it had, uh, you know, made anti-Israel claims, I, I believe. Um, it's, it's something we've seen from, from QPs. Many QPs have supported uh, anti-Israel student groups and have made comments such as these. You know, I've had, um, I've had interactions with QP members, you know, so union members who have written complaints, who have tried everything they can, you know, to have the union stop in, engaging, you know, in, in that type of rhetoric, um, but to no avail, unfortunately. So I, I highly, you know, encourage everyone on the call to, to, to write a letter. I'm sure there's, there's uh, an event that they um, participated in recently. I could probably find one, um, but, but it's, it's been a long standing ordeal, let's say with, with QP, unfortunately. All right. Um... If someone wanted to get in touch with Hasbara, whether it's a student or uh, or uh, uh, someone in the community who really wants to get more involved um, and and wants to, it, perhaps is I don't know if there is such a thing as their training for people who are part of the community to teach them how to engage with the, the, the their local universities, and how would a person get in touch with Hasbara in general? So those are excellent questions. We have had um, training programs for adults and members of the community. Typically when we do our virtual programs, while they are catered a lot of the times to students, they also focus on social media, which I think many members of the community you know, are, are concerned with because they're on social media and they're able to learn tangible skills. We recently held a workshop with Senator Linda Frum and a few workshops on um, how to respond to anti-Israel hatred and anti-Semitism on, on, on social media specifically. That, that many members of the community in, engaged in. And I think they found the sessions very helpful to them. Uh, they were able to gain very, I think, tangible skills that they're able to utilize, you know, as individuals who have social media accounts. 
Um, you know, so that's one thing that, that we do and, and that we do throughout the year. You know, there's different types of programs we offer that community members are encouraged to attend. Um, so typically the best way to do that, I'd say is follow us on, on, on social media, you know, on, on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, please get in, in touch with, with me. Uh, my email is dkoren, so D-K-O-R-E-N at hasbrafellowships.org. Um, you, you know, I'd be happy to speak with any of you. And um, yeah, the, the, there, there are many ways you can get involved. Obviously, there are many ways you, you can support us. You know, we're a grassroots organization and, uh, you know, the, the need for what we're doing, as we see, is there. And, you know, we're trying to engage as many students as possible. Daniel, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. It's such vital work, and hopefully it'll bring a greater sense of calm to a very um, unsettled uh, world that we live in today. Uh, our blessing to you is chazak ve'amatz. You should be strong and of good courage and continue the good fight, and Amen. hopefully the fight will no longer be necessary very, very soon. Amen. Thank, Amen. Yeah. Thank, you, thank very you for spending this time with us this morning. And I hope we get a chance to see much more of you uh, doing the, your important work in our community. And especially, I would just want to leave one last word for the, if any of our, our students are watching this today, or if you watch it later on, on Facebook or on our, our YouTube channel, um, we really do care about your welfare on campus. We want to make sure that you feel safe. We want to make sure that you're getting a, a, a class uh, A education and at the same time can proudly uh, display the fact that you are Jewish, that you support the state of Israel. And if you in any way or in any time feel that you are unsafe or that you're feeling that uh, 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 concerned about your welfare and your ability to proudly display the fact that you're a Jew on campus, uh, please get in touch with Hasbara Fellowships. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable getting in touch with Hasbara, you get in touch with your local synagogue, you get in touch with me, if I'm, if I'm your rabbi, get in touch with your own rabbi, and we'll put you in touch with Hasbara, because it is so important that, that there remain a future, despite the fact that so many of us are returning to Israel, we need to maintain strength within our diaspora communities, and you are our front lines, you are students, our young adults. So anyway, thank you so much for spending this time with us, Daniel, we really appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank, Thank you all for joining us this morning, and we hope to have good news for you soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov.